The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf, I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am now no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Be seated, please. Jesus prays specifically for his disciples. He says, Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words you gave to me, I have given to them. Theologian Karl Barth once made this tongue-in-cheek comment. He said, The word became flesh, and then through theologians it became words again. And while that may be somewhat of an accurate criticism of theology in general for some people, the church nonetheless finds itself dependent upon words. The words that Jesus gave to his disciples here, and of course the oral and written witness of the, all Christians throughout the centuries who precede us. Now this morning I'd like to supplement those words with a powerful image. And this painting that you see, I hope you can see it. It's, it's somewhat dim, but I think it still shows through. This painting is a very famous painting. It is the pendant to the martyrdom of St. Matthew. And it hangs opposite in the Contarelli Chapel of the San Luigi dei Francesi, which is the French church in Rome. And it was particularly appropriate both to the time and to the place. Now, Rome's French community suddenly had in this painting something to celebrate. Because Henry IV, the heir to St. Louis, had recently converted to the faith of his ancestors. The traditional scene of Jesus calling Matthew was presented sometimes inside, sometimes outside. And Jesus was sometimes pictured outside the building with uh, Matthew on the inside and them talking through a window. We're just not quite sure how that played out. But here we have a different rendition of it. And the artist, who is called uh, Caravaggio, all right, he represents this event as a nearly silent and very dramatic narrative. And it is famous because there are so little words spoken. Just two. Follow me. So let's take an in-depth look at what's happening here. Matthew, as you can see, he's the guy in the middle of the table on the left. He is seated with his four assistants, if you will, and they are counting the, uh, the proceeds from the day. And light is coming in from the window at the top right. Jesus is standing at the very top right, and you can see a slight halo above his head, hinting toward his divinity. And he is entering there with Peter. And with a gesture of his right hand, Jesus summons Matthew. Can you see that? Okay. Now, surprised by the intrusion, and perhaps dazzled from the sudden light of the door opening, Matthew draws back. He's the character there in the middle left. He draws back and he gestures to himself with his left hand as if to say, 
Who? You're talking to me? Right? Who, me? And notice that his right hand is still on the coins he has been counting up until Jesus' entrance. Now, the two figures on the very left are so concerned with counting the money, they don't even look up. They haven't even, they're still counting, all right? And the two boys in the middle, in the center there, they do respond. The younger one is, is drawing back toward Matthew as if seeking his protection. And the older one, who is armed, he has a sword, is leaning forward menacingly. Peter, in the foreground here, in front of Jesus, firmly gestures with his hand, calming the group so as to reduce any possible resistance. Now, the dramatic point of this picture is that for this moment, no one does anything, all right? Jesus' appearance is so unexpected, and his gesture is so commanding as if to suspend action altogether. In another second, though, we know that Matthew is unexpectedly going to stand up. He is going to follow Jesus and surprise everyone. And in fact, Jesus' feet, you really can't see him in this picture because the lighting's it's flooded out here. But Jesus' feet are already turned as if to leave the room. And so the power of this picture is in the suspension of action. And it conveys the characteristic human indecision in response to a surprising challenge or command. The picture is also divided into two parts. The figures standing at the right form a, a rectangle, kind of a vertical rectangle, and those gathered around the table form kind of a horizontal block. The costumes are entirely different, too. The costumes of the people on the left represent a worldly attire, because, again, that is kind of their, their, their mindset, while Jesus and Peter are wearing timeless robes, because, after all, Matthew is being summoned to another world altogether. The two groups are separated by this void until Jesus bridges the gap, literally, by reaching out his hand to motion Matthew. And you notice that the shape of the hand is very much like Adam's in Michelangelo's creation, which unifies this picture both symbolically and literally. And so here we have this beautiful portrayal by this Italian Baroque artist of Jesus simply calling a sinner to get up and follow him. And now, today, much later, of course, several years later, now in John's Gospel, we hear Jesus praying that God's word would continue to sustain and protect not only Matthew, but all of Jesus' followers. S.I. McMillian, in his book, None of These Diseases, tells an interesting story of a young woman who wanted to go to college. And her heart absolutely sank when she read the questions on the application, and it asked her, Are you a leader? Being both honest and conscientious, she had to say no. And so she returned the application expecting the very worst. But to her surprise, not long after that, she received this interesting letter from the college. And it said, Dear applicant, a study of the application forms reveals that this year our college will have 1,452 new freshman leaders. We are accepting you because we feel it is imperative that all those leaders have at least one follower. <laughs> and so in an age of leadership and self-direction where all those things are perceived as the key to personal success, Jesus interrupts our strategies, our grand plans, with these simple, direct, and utterly life-giving words, follow me. That is our basic Christian responsibility in a nutshell. But my, how we resist following, don't we? It's kind of like that old saying, most people wish to serve God, but in an advisory capacity only. Dr. George Hawkins, a medical doctor, tells the story of a man from a rural area who came to town to be examined by one of the other doctors because he had this very severe rash. And after the usual history taking, followed by a series of tests, the physician concluded and advised the patient that he would have to simply get rid of his dog because the dog was evidently causing this allergic reaction. And as the man got up and was prepared to leave the doctor's office, the doctor asked him, he said, out of curiosity, are you planning to sell the dog or give the dog away? Well, neither, the patient replied. 
Why not, the doctor asked. Well, he said, I'm, I think I'm going to get me one of those second opinions. It's a lot easier to find another doctor than it is to get a good bird dog. <laughs> and that's the essence of sin. That's the essence of sin, believing somehow that we know better, that it's easier to follow our own paths, our own decisions, our own choices, than to get up and follow Jesus, the great physician. And that's why Jesus is so adamant in today's prayer that his disciples persevere. Peter Forsyth was right when he said, the first duty of every soul is not to find its freedom, but its master. Who or what is your master? And Thomas Akempis echoed that same conviction when he said, Instant obedience is the only kind of obedience there is. Delayed obedience is really nothing more than disobedience. Whoever strives to withdraw from obedience withdraws from grace. I've been holding a book here this morning uh, by Eugene Peterson. It's a marvelous book on discipleship in an instant society. It is one of my favorites. And we face the same challenges of following Jesus as did the disciples. And I'm going to share with you his very brief critique here. Just listen with me. He says, one aspect of world in which Jesus speaks here in John that I have been able to identify as harmful to Christians is the assumption that anything worthwhile can be acquired at once. We assume that if something can be done at all, it can be done quickly and efficiently. Our attention spans have been conditioned by 30-second commercials. Our sense of reality has been flattened by 30-page abridgments. It is not difficult in such a world as ours today to get a person interested in the message of the gospel, but it is terrifically difficult to sustain that entrance. Millions of people in our culture make decisions for Christ, but there is a dreadful attrition rate. Many claim to have been born again, but the evidence for mature Christian discipleship is slim. In our kind of culture, he says, anything, even news about God, can be sold if it is packaged freshly. But when it loses its novelty, it goes on the garbage heap. There is a great market, he says, for religious experiences in our world, but there is little enthusiasm for the patient acquisition of virtue, little inclination to sign up for the long apprenticeship in what earlier generations of Christians called holiness. As Nathan Schaefer suggests, at the close of our lives, the big questions will not be, how much have you gotten, but how much have you given? Not how much have you won, but how much have you done? Not how much have you saved, but how much have you sacrificed? Not how much have you been honored, but how much have you loved and served? Jesus prays for his disciples. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them. Whose words are we following? Let us pray. Lord, as you know, we are bombarded in our age by media, by opinions, by biased slanting and ravings and criticism. Words, words, words everywhere we go. Lord, we are tired, we are exhausted by all the points of view that urge us to follow this and to follow that. Lord, give us clarity today of both hearing and seeing, that we too might hear your command, your invitation to stand up and to follow you. Like Matthew and the disciples, help us to hear your prayer for us today as well, that we too may be, be, be sustained 
by your words and by the living word, who not only precedes but leads in every direction for us as well. Bless us for your work. Bless us in our following. May we listen carefully every day to the words you give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.